is on now. Do I need to have it on? Yeah, is it on the recording for that? Okay, great. We got it. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, so, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, really excited to be here. And I do agree with um, Kenneth about the whole um, energy and back and forth uh, dialogue conversation. So, I hope I'm not the only one speaking through my little speech. But um, I encourage you guys to ask as many questions as you like. You can feel free to interrupt me. Um, I wanted to. I'm really excited about being here. Um, I'm originally from Spain, and I've been here since uh, 1986, studied architecture at Catholic University with my husband, Tony Alonso. And um, I, um, when I started working for someone else, I realized that if I wanted to have a family and would continue working for someone else, it's, I would have to give up one for the other. And I really didn't want that. And I am one of four. And um, like a true Latin, I wanted to have a big family, which means that I needed to either get 80 hours a week in order to have three or four kids, which is what we wanted. And or, or just make not the wage that I thought that I could make in order to make all that happen. So it goes back to what Kenneth was saying. Um, the reason why I started this business in 2001 is because I wanted to make my own hours and I wanted to determine, m reach my true potential and figure out how I was going to balance that with having my kids and be and spend time with them. So um, I quit my job, and, uh, which my husband has been very supportive of, of every one of my crazy adventures. And I told him that I was going to quit my job and I was going to stay home and we were going to live off his salary uh, until we start a family. And um, so we had four kids in five years. I really wanted to do it as fast as possible, so I could <laughs> right to it. So four kids in five years. And um, so our youngest is six months. And I said, okay, we're done with the kids, so now... Uh, back to the real stuff, which is building houses, building something. Um, I come from a house of architects and builders. My dad was an architect, uh, an amazing man. My brothers are architects. My sister is a builder in Spain. So that's what I love to do. And I wanted to figure out how I could do it and have a life too. So we started with very small projects. And I remember very clearly our first project in 2001. Our neighbor wanted to, we have a very big deck in our backyard, 1,000 square feet, and our neighbor wanted us to build a deck for her. So I thought, okay, so I need to incorporate, I need to get a construction license, I need to get some staff, I'm going to build this $20,000 deck. It's a big deck, we were in Fairfax County where pricing structure is a little more um, off the charts in comparison to other areas. But very important factor, you know, when you decide on which uh, areas you want to build in, you want to really uh, figure out what your clientele is looking for and basically cater to that. So wherever you are, it really doesn't matter if you're in Fairfax County or if you're in Baltimore area. You have to figure out where do you want to build, where do you want to renovate, um, and what is your clientele looking for and give them that. Because when you give them that, there's a very short sell cycle. So you don't want to build something that is way too expensive in an area where there's not a market for that. Or you don't want to build something that is not very luxurious in an area where people are looking for luxury. So we live in Northern Virginia, and the demographic there is, is um, very luxurious. So our target was to build projects that are very luxurious, unique, so that they would sell. Um, so anyways, uh, back to our deck project, and I'm not going to talk about, you know, 10 years of projects, but the important thing was that when I decided to take on this deck project, everybody around me except my husband laughed, and they said, you went to architecture school, and you're building a deck. Like, how ridiculous is that, right? And I just thought for a second, well, maybe it is, maybe it's not. The point is that I've never built another deck again 
And I personally dug those 13 footings myself with a bunch of guys. And it was the greatest experience because it taught me very quickly what it takes to build something from drawing to build to having a happy customer. So happy that they overpaid the amount that we actually had charged them. It clearly was under charge. But the point is, I never built a deck again. And since then, we've done numerous uh, renovations ranging from 100,000 to 800,000. And I, I know these are big digits, but remember we're in a very um, expensive area in Northern Virginia where houses cost a million dollars. I mean, you look at that house up there, and that house was 800,000. You think, wow, that's like 50,000, right? That looks like a shack. <laughs> Someone paid it. But it's on three acres in Great Falls. And people pay 800000 for a shack. Now, here's the problem, that they don't like the shack, yet they like Great Falls. So then we have to unshack it. <laughs> and we have to make it look luxurious, right? And so we, we'll show you some photos of the inside. But the inside is like, the outside may not look that big because he didn't let me spend too much money on the outside. But the inside is completely different. And this is another one, a house in Vienna, that house that section of the house above there also cost around 800, 900,000. And we put in 400,000 into this house. Now, why would people do that? Why would they put $400,000 into a house, like almost you know, a third more, right? And it's because they want to live in that area. And what drives people is location, just like the realtors tell you. It's all about location. So people want to live in that area. They see that around there, there's two types of homes. There's the old rundown homes that are in the 800. And then, very close down the street, there are new homes that are around 1.2, 1.4. So they figure it's worth putting in this money. So we get a ho the house the way we want it. And we can pace ourselves with the payments. Because it's very different when you build new as you renovate. Um, I always tell people, if you have all the money, build new because it's cheaper to build new than to renovate. It costs um, about 30% more to renovate than to build new. For the simple reason that when you renovate, you have to pay for demo. And then you have to put in the new. Whereas when you're building new, it's a blank slate, right? Now from a designer point of view, it's also easier to build new than to renovate. And all of you that have done renovations you know what I'm talking about. When you're renovating, I, that picture up there is a picture of a kitchen of a home that is 1.1 million in McLean. And I know you look at that and you go, no way. Right? That's what I thought when I walked in there. There's a house in McLean in one acre with a pool in a very exclusive neighborhood. So people in there are, have no problem spending $300,000 to completely gut their house and make it look like this because they know that they're going to get their money back. So the important thing is for us as professionals is to advise them on what is worth the money and what is not worth the money. So one of the, you're going to see a lot of photos of kitchen. Why? Because kitchen is the number one space in a house that makes the house appealing. You get, in a good economy, you get about 80% of your dollar return on a kitchen. After that, it's bathrooms, and after that, it's the whole house, and the last one is the basement. So if you have a client, or if you're thinking about renovating a house, basement is the last room you want to mess with, because there's like zero return in the basement. Um, it's, unless you're putting a whole new house down there. But if you're just putting carpet and tile and all that, there's no appeal to that. It's the kitchen that appeals to people. That's what sells the house. So if you had a limited amount of money and you're trying to figure out which room I should invest in, the kitchen. Um, it's what sells homes. And so um, that's one of the things that you're going to see a lot of pictures on. But usually a lot of the renovations that we do, we focus on the flow of the house, um, I'm trying to make the space more functional 
Of course, we upgrade the materials. Um, very important to figure out uh, to budget your project. Um, us being architects and builders at the same time gives us a lot of know-how in terms of what's out there in, as in design features and then what, what do things actually cost. Because that's fundamental is to know how much is it going to cost. If I move this toilet over here, how much is that going to cost? So in terms of kitchen, um, the less items, appliances you move, the less money you're going to spend on stuff that people don't really see. So if you can gut a kitchen without moving appliances, uh, putting the oven over there, moving the sink over here, you're putting most of your money on the finishes, which is what appeals to people. So you want to think about that. The bathroom, for example, the last item I move in a bathroom is a toilet because it's the most expensive item you move. So we figure out everything that we can do to this bathroom without moving the toilet. Now, obviously, if at the end you have to move it, you have to move it in order to accomplish what you want to accomplish, right? But these are all things that you want to be considering. Obviously, moving walls has a huge impact. Um, be sure to know which ones to take down, right, from a structural point of view. You want to make sure you, you, you consult with the engineer before you take down a wall. But uh, opening up a space makes a huge difference, adding windows, um, a lot of the times, since it's so trendy right now to have open floor plans, taking doors out makes a big difference in a space. So I'm just throwing things at you guys in terms of what we typically do to a space to make it more, uh, more modern looking. So these are just a whole bunch of examples of before and after projects that we've done where we um, go in, gut the space, and, and transform it into a more modern um, uh, kitchen or, or just modern house in general. I think um, we're going to be transitioning shortly to our, our new home project that, that we are doing now. After 10 years of doing this, do you have a question? Okay. Here. Just curious, I mean, sometimes we have for investors, so that's one mindset, but a lot of times you have a property that's more of a retail type property to in your estimation, as far as now, this is really high-end stuff, but in general, what are the trends now in, in kitchens as far as countertops, floors, and things of that nature? Because a lot of times you look at the materials when you walk in the house and you can kind of guess the age of the house. Oh, the absolutely. Age. So what is the current, you know, are, are we past the granite or are we still looking for, you know, where are we in those types of things? I will tell you uh, one great website, by the way, to get those answers um, is House. I don't know if you guys are familiar with House. You are good. It's H-O-U-Z-Z -Z dot com. But that website invests a lot of uh, money on surveying um, home, homeowners constantly. So they're constantly bringing out new content. But house, H-O-U-Z-Z. -Z. And Zillow, by the way, also has a house um, uh, copycat where they also do very similar um, surveying and so forth. But from our experience, um, white kitchens are in. Um, you know, for whatever it's worth, you see a lot of white. That whole old cherry, uh, dark wood is sort of old fashioned. So white kitchens, white countertops, um, it's uh, stainless steel appliances. And we use a lot of um, LED lights. There's many ways to do it, very expensive ways and cheaper ways in terms of how much you invest in LED, but LED is definitely in. Like this is a very old project as you can see by the color of the cabinets. But granite is never going to go away. It's the, for, in terms of the luxury items, it's the, most, it's the cheapest one. If you did concrete surface, stainless steel surface, Corian, uh, not Corian, uh, uh, silestone, uh, Zodiac, all those surfaces are more expensive. So uh, if you had to put luxury counters, granite is the cheapest surface in terms of luxury, right? Um, white cabinets, dark cabinets for the bathrooms, uh, in terms of fixtures, white, and then you have 
for the faucets and uh, you know the plumbing fixtures, stainless steel and bronze is, are the two um, styles that are, that are in. And then another thing I wanted to bring up in terms of style. I think that people are into, we're finding out that they're into a hybrid style. Not very traditional, but not very modern. So if you can find ways, and on our website we have, you know, many, many, many projects with a lot of before and after photos. And I encourage you guys to um, go on the website. Um, but you'll, uh, we mix modern with traditional all the time. And it's because that's what people want. And in this house that we are currently have on the market, it's very much a hybrid of modern with traditional. Because we're trying to appeal to... You, you're trying to appeal to an unknown client, but to the largest demographic of your unknown client. So you want to make sure that nothing you put in there is just because you like it. You have to put it in there because the majority of your buyers like it. Right? But obviously, the goal is not for us to move into it, right? We want somebody else to pay us to move into it. <laughs> That's the goal, right? So. Um, now we're going to show you the, the, the house that we're, that we're building. And I wanted to also let you know that on our website, avarchitectsbuild.com, I have over 20 videos in there about how to, like how to find a site, how to uh, uh, site your building in the site, uh, how to deal with orientation, and on, on just, just numerous things that um, how to deal with uh, lighting and materials and finishes, all of that. We have many, many videos online that we post for people to, to, um, to learn, basically. And so the, I, I encourage you guys to go on, on that. Yeah? I have a real quick question. So yeah. It's cheaper to buy new than it is to renovate. It's cheaper to build, build new. I'm sorry, build new. Yeah. Sorry. It is cheaper to build new than to renovate. If you're looking strictly at cost per square foot, okay? If you're just looking at that, you know how people, when we are looking to, to um, work for a new client, the first thing they ask us is, well, what's your cost per square foot, right? So know your cost per square foot in renovation and know your cost per square foot in, in new construction. That's fundamental if you want to make money because you need to make sure that at the process of it, you are sticking with your number. Otherwise, you will not make money. And we experience that the hard way because you get caught up in the excitement of, oh, let's do this, let's do that, right? Especially when you have your designer hat on. Um, yes? Well, if you do an $800,000 reno uh, renovation, what kind of profit margins are you looking for you know, when you figure out your pricing? Your profit margin should be um, between you know, 20 to 40. Mm -hmm. okay. And again, one key thing is to, to figure out the difference between markup and margin. Mm -hmm. I discovered that not very long ago, and I actually didn't know that there was a key differentiator between markup and margin. We always think that markup is the same as your margin. It's not. Okay. Uh, actually, in order for you to have a 30% uh, margin, you have to mark up 45%. So if you're marking up only 30%, don't think you're making 30%. You're not. So um, I can send you guys, a, a, if you email me, a video that explains the mathematics behind this. And I was a very good math student, but somehow I missed this. <laughs> so that was eye opening. Yeah. The only reason I asked that was because I, I know you know you renovated those two houses that you've shown before. Well, why don't you just bulldoze and build new houses there instead? It's cheaper. That's a great question. Um, the reason is because in order to do that, you need to have in your hands 1.4 million. And most people don't have that. So it took me 10 years to get the money in my hands so we could do the 3.5 that we're doing right now. So why do people renovate? People renovate because they have 300,000. They don't have 1.3. And they, they, 
mortgaged this house, they bought it over 30 years, and now they just have 300,000 just, right, <laughs> to renovate. If you told them, let's bulldoze your house and build you a new one, they need 1.4, 1.5 million upfront. Most people don't have that. That's why they're willing to spend more money to renovate, to get somewhat what they want. One yes. thing I would add is that at any point we've experienced in certain neighborhoods, there comes a point where there's a certain amount of money that no longer um, makes sense to invest in your house. So this house we're, sh we're going to show next, uh, we worked in this neighborhood for 10 or 12 years prior to doing this project. And it made sense to invest that 400000 to renovate. Not anymore. It's reached, the neighborhood's reached the point where you're not going to invest that amount of money any longer and you're going to start looking at tearing down. And the land, basically, the property's become the land now. The house is the land now. Yes. Yes. I think that one thing that we've learned is that. Um, the whole point of getting into this business was to uh, free up more time and make more money with the time that we were in it. So if we work all over the state, that would defeat our purpose, knowing traffic in this area. So you, you really want to know your area like inside out. Like what do people like here? Where do they shop? What, are they, what, what, what do they absolutely have to have? Right? What are they willing to pay for? And in order to do that, you have to zero in into an area so that you, so that you make sure that you get your money back. Because the biggest danger in this business is to put in too much into something and not get your money back. That's just the sad you know, flip, of the, flip of the coin. So we stayed in Northern Virginia, and we zeroed in on these particular neighborhoods that that we know very well because we've done a lot of renovation. And this house, this lot that we bought for over a million, it's one acre, it's in an area that we know inside out. So we know what the, the buyers want in that area, and we're giving them a house that has all those features. We have an architect's license, and we also have a general contractor license. I think it's fundamental if you're going to be if you're going to be supervising subcontractors, that you have a general contracting license. There's three types. There's the class C. Well, you're in Virginia. Yeah. yeah. Oh, but you still need like a license, right? A bin oh, really? Maybe we should move. I'm kidding. So you don't need a, a contract? There's not. You have the classes that you have in Virginia are a little different. But okay. Value of jobs, yeah. I think it is. Oh, okay. There's two. Yeah, there's like a small project and then a bigger. That's right. That's right. So I think uh, for us, we don't have any uh, contractors on our payroll, which is very good because when you don't have enough work for them, you don't have to pay them. They come on, on job basis. We have uh, two different type of crews. We have crews that do remodel, renovations, uh, rehab, right? And then we have crews that do um, new construction. And why is it not the same crew? Because it's, it's very different when you're building a 10,000 square foot house, which is the one we're going to show you. You really can't be working with Joe the plumber. But, but you need Joe the plumber for your rehab. Because he's got to take his time. He's got to really figure out how he's going to take this toilet and put it over there. And he's got to cut the plywood very diligently. and. That's one guy to do the job. When you're trying to uh, rough in eight bathrooms, Joe the plumber is going to take four months. So you need a big team, right, that goes in there and in one week they knock out all the bathrooms. Time is money, right? So this house here is, um, well, this is a great shot because, you know, it's, it's the demo of the house. So we tore down the house. In this 65 slides that you're going to start, I'm going to keep talking and this is going to just keep rolling. But it's basically uh, out of the, I think, 800 slides that uh, Tony had on our process of building this house, we pulled out 65 just to give you a snippet of what it takes to, 
to build a house from a construction point of view. Now, I'm going to talk about what it takes from, from the management point of view as to gathering your team and, and, and you know, getting the work done. And for us, it was, and, and for you guys too, it's fundamental to figure out who you're going to use for your team. And there's a tendency to get a jack of all trades to do these projects, to basically get one guy to do it all. There's a tendency because since there's not a lot of work out there, there's a lot of guys out there that want to do the whole job. And we feel like, okay, well, I had a tendency to say, okay, well, that's a great idea because that way I'm just dealing with one person. There's a lot of disadvantages to that, I, I have learned, and I'm going to share that with you. When you are working with one person, you are basically have put all your eggs in one basket. If that guy doesn't show up for three days, you haven't moved your project for three days. Okay? If he's overwhelmed and he's not getting the stuff done as quickly as possible, you, you're losing time. So we discovered that it's better to isolate the trades and have 10 different groups that we're dealing with. That way you can also be having the plumber, the electrician, the HVAC team, they're sort of all working at the same time. It's not easy to have a whole bunch of guys in one house and, and not pick on each other. I thought it was a female thing, but guys are the same. <laughs> what? This guy's here? I thought I was going to be here. Why is the plumber here? I was like, well, can't you guys all play nice and get done? No. So, yes? When you talk about isolating the uh, crew, is that for new construction or for your renovation? Same for the renovation. Because that way you're going to get done faster and you're going to get also better craftsmanship. Remember, we do luxury projects, so the end product is key for us selling the product. If the craftsmanship is so-so, people are not going to pay us good money. So the craftsmanship has to be excellent. For that to happen, you have to use specialized trades. So a framer is not a finished carpenter. You know, there's, it's a different skill. And the advantage of having 10 different trades is that you can manage them all and have them overlap and you run your project much faster. And another thing that I learned is that I thought that it would be better if I bought a lot of the materials. That way I could control the cost and also make money on the markup of the material. Well, we discovered that actually it's better for them to buy the material, the installer, like the roofer, for example. It's better for him to buy the roofing material because if I do it, guaranteed, he's going to use more shingles than if they were his shingles. For some reason, we all take care of our stuff more than everyone else's stuff, right? So I, we choose the shingles that we want, and then we tell them, material and labor, all included, don't ask me for a single screw. And it is a lot cheaper to do it that way. And I, we learned that because we thought it was the other way around. And the same for rehab. You pick your tile, go to the tile place, work with the designer there, pick your tile, and once you determine what tile is within your budget, then you tell your installer, hey, I picked up my tile, this is the price, go buy it yourself, bring it, and install it. Now, one thing that, if, I don't know if it's for most of you guys, if this is your full-time thing, then obviously you can spend a lot of time supervising your project, but if you're doing multiple projects and this is not your full-time thing, you can't really be supervising everyone. And I have to tell you that it's fundamental to have somebody there most, most of the time so that you can really make sure that things are not done incorrectly, but then you have to take out and fix it again. You have a question? Sure. So you have the, um, did you guys get the handout? Well, I don't want to like get all, but yeah, if you, if you can, um, yeah, that would be great. So the 10 trades, um, for example, in a, in a new house, really in, in a rehab, you have pretty much the same amount of people too, but you have the, the 
concrete footing crew, right? First you have the, the grading crew, the, the people that demo the house and, and grade the land and get, and get the whole dig out to build the house, right? Then you have the concrete crew, which basically pours the foundations and, 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 and gets the, the slabs done. So then you have your framing crew. Framing crew does all of the wall structure, roof, uh, sub uh, floors and sheathing of the house. Then you have your insulation crew. And the insulation done by a crew, it can be done in two days on a 10,000 square foot house. If you have one guy do it all, it takes much longer and it costs you money. Time is money. So you've got to make sure that this gets done very, very quickly. Then you have your um, siding or exterior finishes, stone crew. Your roofing crew, which typically for us, they do the roofing, the siding, and the gutters. So they're responsible for all of that. Then for interiors, uh, that would be all exteriors. Then interiors, you have your, your millwork people, the people that do all the trim work and the doors and everything that's uh, finished carpentry. Then you have your cabinet people that install all the cabinets, vanities, all of that. Then you have your, your main trades, electrician, plumber, and mechanical crew. So that's three. So I think we're already at like at 15, right? So then we have a countertop crew. And that basically they're the ones that do all of the granite, you know, stainless steel, you know, Korean, whatever countertops we have. Um, flooring crew. Now we have hardwood, carpet. Um, usually the flooring guys just do the hardwood and the carpet, and then we have a whole different crew for tile. And why is that? Because the tile guy is sort of working throughout the whole time we're doing the work in the inside. The tile guy is working. We're going from room to room, and he's getting all the tile work done. Um, after that, I think, oh, the painting crew. That's Usually it's good to have the drywaller be the same guy as the painter, because that way he can't blame the drywaller. <laughs> I can't paint that well because the drywall guy didn't do a good job. and. You know, so then it's this whole thing of pointing thing. So if it's the same guy, then he can just talk to himself, right? <laughs> <laughs> so those two is good to, to, to bundle them up. Um, I think uh, that's, that's about it. Uh, but that's about 15 or so, 20 people. Then you got your landscaping crew, right? And then the grader comes back and he finishes the grading on the house. So this, this is the house you've guys been seeing it, but it's basically a stone and, and brick. There's no siding on this house, and the house is about 10,000 square feet. Um, we looked at the trends. We, I made a list, basically, of the top 20 things that people have told us over the last 10 years that they didn't like about their home. And we made sure that those 20 things are in this house, resolved. And I'll tell you guys a couple of the things. You can go on our website and and look at the features of this, we call it the 360 home, and it has a list of the top 20. But some of the things that people are looking for in, in more modernized homes, so whenever you're re refurbishing a house, you, you're trying to make it look new, right? And so you want to put in some of the new perks. And one of the things is um, um, for the house to have a mud room, you know, a, a room that we all kind of walk in to put all our stuff down. It's usually off, off, the, off the garage. So a mudroom in these type of level homes is fundamental. A big, spacious, with a lot of storage mudroom. Now the second thing is the laundry room. A lot of people have their laundry room in either right off the kitchen or in the basement. And it's a <coughs> terrible location for it. Um, clearly, whoever thought of it didn't do laundry too often. But as women, we know the laundry room should be upstairs because that's where the laundry gets generated. So I, you don't know how many the renovations we've done where the instigator of the renovation is, I want to move the laundry room upstairs. That's how the project starts. And then all of a sudden, we're like gutting the whole house. But that's like the, the like I can't hand take it anymore. The laundry room is in the basement, and everything is upstairs, right? So laundry room upstairs is fundamental. 
than having um, a very open floor plan where the rooms really kind of bleed into each other and, and not a lot of divided spaces. Um, yes? Now, I know you were saying you do white cabinets. What made you go with dark That The dark ones are in the basement in a separate kitchen. There's a rec room in the basement, and that's sort of like the, the man cave and, and where the, all the TVs are, and that's where the Super Bowl, I'm sure, will happen. But um, that one is darker. But the one in the kitchen, they're white in this house. Yeah. Um, I know part of the cost, but how come you didn't go with stone all the way up and you cut it off and didn't go with stone? Cost. cost. Yeah. Brick is a lot cheaper than. Siding is the cheapest, right? What about the design also? Because it was, this is a large home, it would look a little too massive and small, so it would be stone and brick work as well. When it comes to exterior finishes, the, the siding is always the cheapest option. Um, hardy plank siding is what we typically use, but obviously vinyl is even cheaper. And then you go to brick as the next item, and then stone as being the most expensive one. However, people are attracted to stone and brick. Somehow they feel like if you build a brick house, it's going to stand longer. <laughs> right? It's, don't you hear that? So if you can incorporate some brick, like even if it's just below the window, the water table, it just, yeah, so we're back to slide one. But any other questions? Can I just review those grooves categories one more time? Sure. Um, I had on exterior, I mean interior, uh, cabinet, uh, carpentry or trim work, plumber, countertops, flooring, it's also carpet, tile is different, uh, painting and drywall, it's uh, HVAC and electrical. Right. And on exterior, I think I missed one, but I got framing, I got concrete, insulation. Did you say roofing and siding are the same? Yeah, roofing, gutters, and siding. Mm -hmm. All right, and I think I missed one on exterior. Landscaper. Landscaper. A concrete. The yeah. concrete crew, the ones that do all the foundation and, and, and foundation walls, that's the concrete crew. Okay. Right, these guys, exactly. So you have the foundation, then you get your framing crew. And for us, the framing crew installs the windows also. And it's for the same reason that if you have somebody else doing it, they're going to tell you that the hole is not squ square. And really, no square is square. This is man-made, you know, not square. It's, you just have to work with it. I don't think it's a demo in grading. Oh, uh, yeah, you're right. The first crew that comes in is the demolition. And it's, they're called site crew, but they're basically demo the house and, you know, uh, 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 take down all the trees and clear the land, and they also make the hole for the foundation. Okay? Did you have a question? Compact the soil around. Ah, yes. That's a great tip. Yes. And it's it's so simple to do when you're in that in that stage. It's just that. In the process of trying to get it done, you miss sometimes those very important tips. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. And from a construction point of view, you know, we, we make sure that you kind of keep building some insurance and use a higher grade um, waterproofing material on your, on your um, basement walls because you don't want problems coming back to you as a builder. We use two by six wall construction. Um, we do that because a lot of people ask, what are you doing about green design or sustainability? Well, the two biggest areas, for, in our opinion, is, is, from, is energy. So you, your, your exterior envelope, if you use two by six, you can get more insulation in there. We use the blown-in insulation and some foam insulation. 
in certain areas, and it's becoming more of a code issue now um, that higher, much higher insulation values. And then we use the LED light, low voltage all through the house. <coughs> and your exterior envelope and your lighting right there is your, I think, the two greenest things you could do because it's just integrated into your construction. Not that using green products is a good thing, but um, those are your biggest impact items in terms of energy use. And good windows. <laughs> yes. So, um, question? Any, any other questions? Yeah. What kind of time frame do you look for in building and in rehabbing? It, typically, our renovations take, um, you know, about a, a month to four months. You know, 99% of our renovations, uh, the homeowner is living in the house. So key is to get in and get out before they hate you. <laughs> so you want to plan. Planning is, is key. When, by the time we go into a, re a renovation and we got the kitchen, we have a full set of plans specifying everything that we're going to be doing. We have a fixed price with the customer, meaning in, in, in 12 years, I've never charged a client more money than what we told them we were going to charge them. And I can tell you that most people in our industry don't, cannot say that. And how, why can we do that? It's because we plan. We plan ahead. We make sure that we have all of our materials in their garage. The last thing you want to do is tear that lady's kitchen out and then say, oops, our stuff is somewhere in Minnesota and it'll get here in three weeks. And now she can't cook for three weeks. And nobody's working. Because it's okay if people are working, but if nobody's working, she's going to hate you for sure. So we, I have all my material in the garage ready to go. And we have the drawings, and we have the fixed price. And then we go in and gut. So when we start, we can very uh, comfortably say we're going to finish on this time. Now, for the new homes, you know, a house can be built in eight months. This house took us 12 months. Uh, granted, it's over 10,000 square feet. So if you build a house that's smaller, obviously it's going to take you less time. But planning is, uh, is the key to, to it being successful knowing exactly who's going to be working on it, what are they going to be doing, and how much is it going to cost. And buying materials up front, especially in today's economy, um, you can even rent a little space and put in all your stuff in there because the prices keep changing. And so if you priced it out in March and then all of a sudden you start building in September, you might be paying 5 or 10% more, and you can't go back and go charge somebody. So you lose that money. So you can buy a lot of the materials and like appliances, cabinets, those are the, the key. The number keeps changing all the time. So I hope this was useful to you guys. It's a lot of information and I know I took probably a little bit of your time. <laughs> So, uh, okay. what do you think about uh, my good friend? Thank you. Thank you.